Hello, everybody, and welcome to the next Open UK Future Leaders training session. Uh, a little bit about the Future Leaders Group of Open UK. We are a collection of individuals who are interested in open technologies, including open source software, open hardware, and open data. Uh, we include a wide range of people that work in technology, intellectual property, outsourcing, procurement, data, coding, and innovation, and includes both private practice lawyers and in house counsel that work in the technology sector and related fields. We operate under the direction of Open UK's Legal and Policy Committee. Um, with a clear purpose to bring together and develop future leaders in legal and policy matters relating to open technologies and to support and further the mission of the Legal and Policy Committee. My name is Robert Cornells and I'm one of the co-chairs of the Future Leaders Group along with Katie Gibson from Bristow's and we're both lawyers advising on technology and commercial matters. The group is always open to new ideas and new members where they get involved in all of our activities or just dipping in and out of our various projects. And I'd like to uh, welcome today our presenter for today's session, Matt Jarvis. Over to you, Matt. Thanks, Rob. Um, so I've always thought that, that these kinds of sessions are um, most useful with um, lots of time for questions and discussion. Um, so I'm going to keep the, the slideware element here fairly uh, minimal. Uh, I've got a few slides to sort of set the scene and, and um, create some talking points. And then I hope um, we can we can have some uh, a kind of open forum discussion and and folks can basically ask me anything either in the uh in the comments or or if folks want to uh unmute or or uh, or come on video you can ask me um in person um so uh hopefully my slides will catch up yep so this is me um my name's matt jarvis um i am a director of community at a software development company uh, based in san francisco called uh, d2iq um, and uh, my job at D2IQ is basically, uh, I, I have quite a few different hats. Um, I manage all of our open source communities, and I also um, uh, look at our strategy around uh, how we consume, contribute, and release open source software. Um, I'm also a, uh, a board member at Open UK, and I've been... Um, had a wide and, and varied career um, that I usually just describe as building stuff with open source software um, uh, for something like 20 years. I think I, I started using uh, Linux around the, the mid 1990s and uh, you know, I've pretty much uh, worked around open source software um, ever since. So I'm going to start um, with what might seem like a, uh, a, a slightly contradictory and perhaps controversial statement. Um, the, 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 that open uh, doesn't actually mean anything. Um, just because something's open, it doesn't imbue it with any magical powers. Um, it doesn't make it uh, per se any better than anything else. Um, Perhaps you might get some small benefit by being able to uh, make changes yourself if you want to, if we're talking about, about software. But the vast majority of software users um, don't actually have any interest in doing that. They just want to use software to achieve um, whatever it is that they've set out to want to do. So the real uh, power of open is about collaboration. And collaboration requires building communities of people. So the real aim of open is to create collaborative communities with a shared goal. And in my context, that goal is to build um, open source software. Once we have those collaborative communities, that's where the real power of free and open source software um, starts to be expressed. That's where we start to see development cycles um, speed up. That's where we start to see uh, product and code quality increases. And that's where we start to see high quality um, software as the, as the output. And, and ultimately, um, the, the open source really isn't just about um, having the having the source code open, it's that this model has proved to produce the highest quality software.
So what do we mean when we say um, community? Um, in open source software projects, um, our communities are typically composed of these three main groups. Um, we have the users who just use our software. We have contributors who contribute perhaps code, perhaps uh, surrounding artifacts like documentation. And then we have maintainers who um, effectively lead the projects and drive the projects forward. And uh, this isn't only expressed in terms of individuals. Um, as open source has, has taken over the world, uh, and particularly in larger open source projects, we can also consider companies uh, to be members of any one of these three groups. And really, our, our aim in, in successful and ideal open source communities is to move people through these categories so that we have a constant flow of new people to work on things. We want to put new users into the top of that funnel. We want users to become contributors as they become more, uh, more used to using the project and, and more engaged with the community. And ultimately, we need contributors to become maintainers because nobody or very few people um, are likely to stay in a single open source project for the entire lifetime of their of their uh, of their involvement in software so we need to have that flow coming through this funnel in order to be successful um, as a as a community but we can also look at community from a more human perspective what drives people um, together with shared interests and uh, more importantly in in our roles as as uh, community builders and community managers, what keeps them there? And here's the, the definition from Wikipedia of, of community. A community is a social unit with commonality, such as norms, religion, values, customs, or identity. And when we, when we build and maintain communities, we really need to keep these people-centered ideas at the top of our minds, because ultimately, communities are about people. They're not actually about software. That may be um, that may be a, a product of that community, but the community itself is about people. And so, uh, managing communities successfully um, means you have to be very aware of what motivates and drives people to come together, and as I said, more importantly, um, to stay together. And not all communities need to be alike uh, to be successful. Uh, there's lots of different um, uh, governance patterns and, and, and types of, of community, even in the open source world. Um, we do, uh, there's tended to be uh, two uh, main patterns that these things fit into in open source software. Um, uh, technical meritocracy, where um, Everybody is considered equal um, in terms of uh, their their uh, potential contribution, and leaders and and uh, and uh, maintainers um, move to the forefront of those communities through being uh, the uh, the technical leaders in those communities. And technical meritocracies are usually highly uh, consensus driven, so decisions made by um, consultation widely across the community and this tends to be what we call lazy consensus i.e if you disagree um you need to say something otherwise we assume that you agree and examples of this might be projects like openstack which we'll come back to a little bit later or or um uh, uh, projects like kubernetes and the the other model that's been very common in open source communities is this benevolent dictator model and this these communities uh, uh, like this tend to have a single leader who's the ultimate um arbitrator of, of decision making and examples of this are the linux kernel with linux torvalds as that that role um we could also talk about uh, the ubuntu operating system with with mark shuttleworth um but these no matter what kind of model these communities have, they're ultimately going to share some characteristics. 
And um, uh, these are the kinds of things that, um, that uh, as community leaders, um, we need to uh, work towards um, to ensure that our communities are going to be successful. And so some of the, the things that are that are characteristic of open source um, communities, there should be no discrimination to participation. Um, everybody should be able to be part of a community and contribute to it. Um, these communities have uh, right at their very heart, they're about collaborating on software development, so highly collaborative. And then the, some of the most important things for me are transparency. So no matter what governance model your community may be following, um, it's important that everybody has a very clear shared understanding of that. And that can only be achieved by being highly transparent between your decision making processes, how you're doing things, your development model has to be highly transparent. And ultimately, that comes down to open communication. So um, everything needs to happen um, out in the open. This is the kind of cornerstone um, on, on where, which all of these other things uh, rest. So the governance, the development, the design. Um, in the OpenStack project, uh, they define this idea of four opens as the key to successful communities. Um, open source, open design, open development, and open community. And um, Thierry Carras, who's the, the OpenStack Foundation uh, development director, has done several very interesting talks about the four opens that you can, um, that you can find on, uh, on, on YouTube. About, and that's about how he believes that uh, that without those all of those things, you can never build um, successful um, open source communities. So how do we go about creating these communities? Well, uh, one way we almost never create communities is to uh, boot code over a wall and expect people to start contributing to it. Um, this is still a fairly regular occurrence, especially from large companies um, for, for a variety of reasons, sometimes because they just don't ha understand how open source works, and sometimes because they don't want uh, the maintenance overhead of having to um, support that software. This is a, a, a quote from Jess Rizal, very uh, well-known um, engineer in the, uh, the open source container world, um, uh, uh, after seeing uh, another example of this at a, at a conference where a company announces something and expects a, a community to magically um, build up around it. Um, and uh, communities also very rarely these days happen by accident. Um, when I started using and working with open source in the uh, mid 1990s, the majority of open source projects were um, scratching itches that people had themselves as individuals. So we needed a kernel to run our computers. Uh, we needed a web server. We needed operating system software. We needed replacements for a lot of the tools that we had to use every day, um, word processors, image editors. And uh, at that time, almost all of those tools that were widely used were proprietary. So what that meant was that there was a latent uh, desire in people to work together um, to get those tools. And if you look back, for example, at the history of the Apache web server, um, that community was really already there in terms of um, users of uh, the um, uh, NCSA web server that, that Apache was based on. And they their need to make changes to it so that it worked better for their particular use case really organically drove uh, the creation of that particular community. These days, um, open source is everywhere. There are literally millions of open source projects. Um, and that makes it exponentially more difficult to find your users and your developers for your particular project for your community. Um, these stats are from GitHub Hub from last year, so these will be even bigger than now. And you can see from the vast scale of these numbers, um, the, the amount of um, source code 
there is now out there literally tens of millions of projects and so I, I think the important questions we need to ask ourselves is um, what do people want to gain from joining a, a particular community um, these are the things that make them join to start with and they're the things that are going to make them stay or leave and move on uh, what actually drives people um, to collaborate in this way. Some of this uh, may just be this uh, specific interest in a particular field of technology, but just gathering together people with that single uh, interest is, n is not likely to be enough to sustain um, a long-term community where people are committing a um, significant amount of, of times to them. So uh, outside of those purely technical things, um, these are some of the things that, that um, people are looking for when they um, get engaged in, in communities, um, a sense of accomplishment, having, having done something, having built something, uh, feelings of reward, feelings of recognition, recognition particularly amongst your peers, amongst um, folks whose, whose technical opinions uh, you uh, respect. Um, a sense of ownership, so feeling like that community actually is, it's not something external to you. You're a part of it, you own it, you're, um, you're involved in how that community is developing and moving forward. And a sense of belonging, so uh, I feel like I uh, have found my place amongst people who I um, share uh, cultural norms and share um, share um, goals and and uh, and values with and if we look at um, Maslow's um, hierarchy of needs pyramid which is a, a very famous uh, diagram about uh, human nature and what actually drives people uh, we can see that those things map very clearly onto um, uh, basic human traits that, that Maslow had identified. So these ideas of self-actualization, building yourself, improving yourself, um, esteem, reward, uh, being respected by others, and these ideas about belonging, about being part of a uh, part of a um a, a set of people with with shared values and, and shared norms and then the safety aspect clearly that that plays into so again some of these ideas about about shared norms about shared sets of behavior so you don't feel like you're um uh you feel uh, uh, that you can express yourself in 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 uh, ways that are comfortable to you and that people aren't going to be um be negative or be uh, attack you for that and so taking those things into account there's been as people have recognized the 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 value proposition of community driven development and you know, we've seen that vast growth in 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 uh, in open source software. Um, new roles and craft have have emerged, and community management as a practice has become uh, a very well recognised job, and it's a vital part of building and maintaining um, communities. So you can think of community managers as a bit like gardeners, um, tending the community. Um, ensuring that everything is going in the in the right direction. Um, in reality, uh, community management is a, a, a slightly more complex role. Uh, involves lots and lots of different hats, spinning lots and lots of plates all of the time. Um, good community managers have to be um, effective motivators. They have to kind of have an understanding of, of human psychology. Uh, these days, more and more, because the you know the uh the there is so much software out there you have to be a very good marketeer in terms of promoting your project you know social media um websites blogging all that kind of stuff and a, a whole bunch of, of other things but then the real function of community management you know if you can distill that down is to be an enabler 
So we enable our users to easily use the software and we enable our developers uh, to be most efficient in the practice of open source software development. So to, you know, it's a role that's about um, uh, both kind of uh, uh, um, onboarding folks at every stage, reducing friction um, and, uh, and removing barriers. And as I said, promoting your projects become much more important. Um, so uh, ultimately, um, our aim is a kind of virtuous circle. If your uh, community is happy and productive, um, people feel rewarded by their contributions. They'll contribute more. Um, they'll act as, as ambassadors for your community, encouraging others to join, uh, promoting the project, which then grows your user base and potentially your developer base, and, and round we go again. So even if I filled this entire slot with, with slides, um, there, there wouldn't really be enough time to go into uh, huge detail about the practice of community management and building community. So um, as I said, I, I'd, I'd love us to have some open discussion about this, but I've also picked out some key resources as well for that, that anybody who's interested in this space really, really should read. Um, uh, firstly, The Art of Community. Uh, it's a book by John O'Bacon, and it's probably a key text in, in community management and, and really codified um, a lot of the practice of community management. Um, John was originally the, the community manager uh, for the Ubuntu project, but that was probably one of the first um, uh, formalized community management uh, roles and it is now widely regarded as the leading expert in the field. It's the Bible for community managers and anyone interested in community. Um, so I urge you to, to uh, read that book. Um, Jono knows far more than I do about building community and uh, has a, a fantastic ability to, to express that very clearly. Um, Jono's website, uh, jonobacon.com, also has a, a wealth of information and resources on it. And you can find tons of his talks on, on YouTube. Um, he also does a bunch of free online courses that you can register for. So please do um, check his stuff out. And the second link there, opensource.guide, is a set of, of really great guides uh, from GitHub, um, including this building community, a really good one on building community. Um, in terms of the history of, of, of how uh, a lot of these ideas about community have been codified, um, Eric Raymond's essay, uh, The Cathedral and the Bazaar, is the definitive work on open source development practice and why this model, um, why this model works. Um, again, another one, if you're interested in the history of the movement and how a lot of those things that we rely on uh, today came to pass, um, I highly recommend Glenn Moody's book, um, Rebel Code. Um, it really covers the, the, that period in the, uh, in the 1990s where um, things like Linux and, and the Apache web server, these really big open source projects um, emerged and, and how we started to, uh, to develop communities that could sustain them. I've also linked to the, uh, the OpenStack Foundation's um, Four Opens book which is uh, freely available. Uh, you, it's also, uh, as everything with the OpenStack Foundation, fully open source. So you can, uh, you can even contribute to it if you like. And finally, something that's been released fairly recently, um, the Trillions and Trillions Served uh, documentary from the Apache Foundation, which is available on YouTube. It's a really uh, fascinating um, documentary interviewing uh, many of the people who are involved in the Apache Foundation and talking about um, what links together um, the all of the Apache projects that come under that uh, under that umbrella in what they call the Apache way. So that's a great set of resources for for anybody who's interested in community. I would highly encourage you to uh, to reach out uh, and and grab those and and have a read of them. And um, I'm more than happy to uh, to uh, answer questions, have a discussion please uh, feel free to chip in. Matt, it's Amanda. Um, hey, Amanda. You're not on video, so I don't think I'm going to put my video up either. It's quite a nice way to do this. Um, the last thing you said there is something that I find quite confusing for a long time. 
the Apache way. And I read a book by Denise Cooper recently on Inner Source. And in that, Jim, Jigl I can't say his surname, Jigleski? Jigleski, yeah. Yeah. So Jim uh, wrote a chapter in that inner sourcing book about the Apache way that I found really helpful. But it seemed to me that it was community over code. Is there something more to it than that? Or is that that the... I think, it's, I think it's interesting because that's actually what they say. That there's lots of different definitions of what the Apache way is in the in the documentary. Um, I, I don't think I have a definitive uh, answer for that either. But community over code is what they've always, how they've always um, described uh, uh, that. And I've always taken that as being um, a kind of, in a, in a sense, the same distillation as... Uh, as um as thierry was was trying to get to with the four opens that um the code itself is only you know it it only has power in conjunction with all the other things so you know open code on its own isn't anything because you know you don't get all the additional things about um you know about the the power of of open source software development so that's kind of what how i've always taken it it's, it's a different way of saying the same thing that um you know in some ways the 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 terminology open source sort of tends to focus too much doesn't it on the that the source code is there and i mean we can remember you know times in the early 2000s i think when when microsoft said well it's all right we're we're giving source code to our customers you know and it's kind of like yeah but you're missing the point there because that's not the point of it that's interesting i'm thinking about what you're saying to me as i'm hearing it so I've been talking a lot about business models and trying to reiterate to people that open source is not a business model and the different things that it is. And I talk about uh, a sort of collaborative methodology. I don't know that I actually make the point clearly enough that community's at the heart of it. And that's something worth taking on board from what you're saying today. Yeah. Um, I, mean, I know other people my message anyway i mean others, others may may disagree right i mean mm -hmm. you know we work ultimately in 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 open organizations and you know lots of viewpoints are out there but I, i've always said to people that that uh you know without without um building those communities you cannot have great software it's just doesn't you know the fact that it's open doesn't mean anything yeah and then for us, one of the things that a lot of the people who either are here today or will be listening to this later, for a lot of us, we are in adjunct communities. So communities around governance, uh, legal support for open. Mm. Um, do you have any suggestions on how we grow our communities better? A lot of those started with lawyers and lawyers have a tendency not to want to share, you know, around open, they're better than normal because they will share, but there's still reluctance, uh, things like privilege stop them wanting to, to share. What if you were to say, you know, there's three key things if you want this community to grow and align with open, and I hope this isn't putting you on the spot too much, but what would those three things be, Matt? Well, I mean, I, I think you have to go back to those, you know, let me flip back through, you know. You know, we're bearing in mind that a lot of people also who are involved with this are hopefully younger at the early stage of building a career and their personal brands and participating in these communities around it. So it's a learning curve for everybody, even us oldies. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, but you know, I mean, there are there are lots of adjunct communities that you know that that as we know, you know, have taken those principles of of open source software and applied them to other things, right? You know, we've had open hardware, we've got you know, um, open data and those kind of things now. And I, I think all the, these communities share these these basic things because otherwise you don't get community if you don't have these these ideas that are at the absolute heart of what you're trying to do then you know you will never get uh you know though, though these things this set of things that are on that are on that slide now this accomplishment reward sense of ownership belonging shared cultural norms 
those apply to any community, right? That could apply to a community of people who enjoy knitting. You know, and if I belong to to a particular group that is that is, you know, um, and and all of a sudden half of the people in that group or or whatever suddenly have vastly different view views from me or values or whatever then i'm probably not going to stay in that group right I, I think these are human things they're you know and um yeah so these are there's these are human things and should be pretty much um uh universal and what i think what you can take in adjunct communities from open source is that we've tested the model mm -hmm. you know so look for the practice of it in terms of you know i mean you, you look at any foundation how things are governed voting all those kind of things mm -hmm. we we've tested it for 20 years right it worked yeah. and so right. if you're looking to create an adjunct community based on these kind of values you would do you would do well to look at um some particularly things like apache like the open Source foundation and some of these bigger projects with where they've highly codified all this stuff because of the scale Mm -hmm. those things are proven to work yeah I'm just, I know other people are waiting to ask you questions but I've just got one more that relates to this um well it's fascinating and I don't get to see you at conferences anymore so now I'm getting a chance to talk to you the um there's an, a movement that you may have heard of called intrapreneurs and a, a lot of folk trying to do good from within organizations yeah. with nothing to do with technology and I happen to meet a lot of people from that in the last 12 months and they often read, you know, you gave a book, a list of books there. They often follow uh, Frederick Laloux and Peter Koenig's work. And they talk about leadership and source. They don't mean our open source source. They mean the source of leadership. And they talk about the fact there can only be one source. And then they debate um, whether or not communities work as a way for leadership. And I was talking, I went to something with Peter Koenig and I was talking to him about it and saying I didn't agree with them because I thought it was possible and that the open source community gives examples of where you don't have to have the benevolent dictator model, but you can actually build a community and see multiple leaders. And he pushed back and said to me that he's looked at this and even in open source, there is always a single leader on any project. Do you think that's right? Can you think of any projects that don't always at any point in time demonstrate even if it's an elected leader that changes on a regular basis from the communities. Are I, I there any commune communities that we could look at? Uh, well, I, I think there's a, that, that's one of the things where um, where some of these consensus models have come out of, isn't it? Because um, it, 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 if you look at open source, if you look at, at successful open source development communities, I, I you know, it, I'm not quite sure whether he's saying they don't create leaders or whether there are you have to have somebody who's leading in he says any... there always has to be one leader even if lots of people think they're leading there is really only one leader at any point in time and if he's talking on a macro on a macro level then yeah. you know when you look at large open source projects that's almost always true mm -hmm. in the sense that um you know if we take a project like kubernetes right it's got hundreds and hundreds of sub projects in it there is almost always a a maintainer but whether that that maintainer is is may or may not have be the ultimate arbitrator of decision making, you know, the the still um, the still uh, most decision making being taken by lazy consensus, and so although yeah, I mean it's a difficult one to say because clearly, you know. Um, there may be uh, differentials of power there, and and you know all that kind of stuff that's hard to hard to define. I I would definitely say that I have never seen um, any projects succeed that have a fully uh, flat open uh, model. There may be there may be ones that exist, um, yeah. But you know, the, one of the one of the big challenges in community uh, management is um, is always about um, stopping things turning into talking shops and yeah. you know, biases towards action. And it, so, in a sense, you always need somebody who's 
who's kind of uh, at least herding, vaguely herding the cats in the right direction. Mm, that makes sense. And, and that can go from, you know, that can go from uh, someone with very strong opinions to someone with much more uh, consensual type approach. But when you actually analyze what they're doing, they're still steering. Yeah. You know? Yeah, um, but you know the benevolent dictator model is difficult as well, though. I mean, you know, there's certainly been <laughs> very, very many, very many open source projects which have found themselves with a unbenevolent dictator, yeah. and the the community is is broken because yeah. because they've broken that shared cultural norms yeah. and they've broken that idea of sense of ownership. Yeah. So you know that's always the danger for the some people, you know. There have been many people throughout the, the, the history of open source who, uh, you know, don't have the people skills to be able to uh, manage that stuff and end up alienating people. And therefore, either people fork the code base and go and do it somewhere yeah. else, or they just drop out and stop doing it. Yeah. I, it's, mean, uh, I know that um, the next person who I think is in line, there's a couple of people in line, Rob and Jonathan, to ask questions. But the next person in line is Jonathan, I think. And um Jonathan, you and I share something in common, and it's that we've all worked in Canonical, where that's where I first came across a benevolent dictator. And for anyone on this call or who's listening who doesn't know, Mark's nick is SAB DFL, self-appointed benevolent dictator for life. Uh, it's a, a great example of a, a dictator, a benevolent dictator. Jonathan, yeah, we looked at lots of them, you know, uh, Larry Wall from Pearl. Um, mm -hmm you know uh programming languages tend to throw them up because um a lot of programming languages have come out of the head of one individual to start with right and they have a very clear idea of where that project needs to go um hmm. you know, i would say in operating systems i don't know actually there's been a couple in operating systems as well but uh yeah i think uh, i think mark took that from the, the kind of pearl idea really yeah, there's, Jonathan. I was going to comment on that, which is just a thought that occurred to me and may or may not be true, but obviously there's no right answer in terms of is it better to have a meritocracy like we do in KDE where everybody contributes or maybe Debian um, or, or that benevolent dictator. I slightly wonder if meritocracy leads to slightly more uh, unfocused results and not necessarily grabbing the mantle when new ideas are needed. Um, uh, but it helps with longevity in that Debian's been going on since forever, KDE's been going on since what, 1996 or something. Um, and so neither of these projects have taken over the world, but they're both very successful and they've both been very successful for a long time. And I, I ju just had the thought of, I wonder if the um, a more top-down approach, sometimes um, it can either succeed or if the leader ship gets it wrong then then it can fail and not quite last so long i don't know if that's true or not i haven't thought that through I, uh, yeah i mean i, I think it, but those are, it's interesting that those two you give those two projects as an example jonathan i think because you know those those are projects that span that that period in time that i was talking about at the start this talk between you know folks who were scratching their own itch and who and and i think a lot of the debian and and kde developers still tend to fall into those buckets whereas you look at a lot of the the newer big open source projects people tend to be employed by organizations and you know the vast majority of open source developers these days are actually employed by companies and and so in a sense they whilst their companies aren't aren't um you know directly or, the, or at least the good ones are not directly uh trying to exert uh, influence over a particular project they are they do have some impetus and in, in terms of action um whereas when when you get projects which are much more like uh composed of uh, of developers in their spare time then i think it, it probably is uh you know it's slightly more difficult to to manage that um but i mean in K in kde uh presumably um you know you would say the same leadership model exists in the sense that you have component maintainers and all that kind of stuff it's a, it's not just a, a a kind of a communist model where everyone's on the uh, the same right yes absolutely so there's a, yeah. a social social setup for that and yeah and people are people there's get no technical barriers but there's always social 
um, yeah. oversight and control of, of the individual projects, which is necessary. Yeah, I mean, that's what I love about open source, though, right? It's a real opportunity for people to to uh, get leadership experience because, it, it, you know, for people who are who are um, have some some bit of kind of entrepreneurial idea about them, you know, technical meritocracies are a great place to to uh, move into leadership roles. And I mean, I say this to to software engineers you know, on a, on a regular basis about getting involved in, in open source that, you know, they are, there, there are real opportunities to, uh, to uh, move your career forward by participating in, in open source. Um, the, you know, there were um, barriers to getting involved in things and to starting to lead things are, are different from perhaps the barriers and, and uh, things that, that exist inside companies. And I also had the other question or random chat point to make, um, which was about uh, non-technical communities. I've been um, giving some talks recently about the works I've been doing with, with canoeing communities, where there's some projects making maps I've run, um, checking up river levels and, and writing a book. And I've tried to apply the open source principles, and it's really useful that you've got the, the slides here that show what some of those principles are. Um, to to those projects which from for mostly non-technical people and had limited success to it um and that's partly because the tooling isn't there but it's partly because the culture isn't there as well um and it's partly because i've applied these principles not not as fully as maybe they need to be applied um in order to make it happen um i don't know if that will change with more people being used to online work with with lockdown um open source is more than just working online of course it, it's all these stuff that you put in your slides um have you seen it have you seen any success or non-success with non-technical communities with these principles uh, it's difficult to say what you describe as non-technical communities isn't it i mean you know clearly it clearly works best in in uh, scenarios where people can contribute without um uh without necessarily having physical barriers to being able to do that. You know, there's lots of, you know, would you describe Wikipedia as a non-technical community? I, I, you could describe Wikipedia as a non-technical community in a sense, right? You don't need any particular, um, any particular high level of technical skills to contribute to a wiki. I would, and I think it's anybody who's not coding. So it's all the different communities. Yeah, I would, and, and and the book, the writing part. There have been lots and lots of examples of that, and clearly Wikipedia is probably the most, the most impressive of those. You know, when you look at you know what it took to write an encyclopedia when when we were kids, Amanda. You know, I mean that, that you're talking about employing thousands of people, and you know, it's a gigantic undertaking, and you know. I think in some ways Wikipedia probably doesn't get as much uh, as much credit as it should these days, you know, because people are so used to having the information of the world at their fingertips. But I mean, that that's one of the most incredible endeavors that's ever been undertaken in the history of humanity. I mean, you know, and uh, that you mentioned them because Dr. Sarah Thomas, who is a Wikimedian in Scotland, is actually going to talk to us on the 31st of July. I think that's four weeks today. Um, uh, she's going to talk about yeah, four weeks today. She's going to talk to us about Wikimedia, and it will be interesting with the benefit of having listened to the map and uh, how to, how that will fit into this. Because she's going to talk about having built that community there in Scotland and some of the other projects they do. Mm. But uh, I mean, I also think you can, you know, you can look at. Uh, I mean, in in lots of ways, um, any. If we wanted to talk about things that are that are that are in the physical world, you know, th these are these are not new ideas, right? They're they're the same ideas that uh, you know everybody who lives in a in a in a in a communal organisation shares. I mean, you know, and and those people have been living like that for you know many decades, and and the principles of how those communities work. Are still the same, you know. They're still about collaboration. They're still about these things, you know. These raw sense of ownership, belonging, shared cultural norms, sense of accomplishment. You know, these are human, human um, 
uh, traits, you know, and that's what the Maslow's pyramid thing shows that, that they are actually what make people happy. And it's really, it's kind of amazing in a sense that, you know, it's taken us uh, this long as a species to work this out. I mean, I, I think probably if we applied these principles to all areas of human endeavor, then, um, you know, we might be more successful. Uh, and I guess uh, there are vested interests in us not doing that because it empowers people. You know, I think you've got a really, I think you've got a really good point there, Matt. I think it's, it's this is Rob here. It's, uh, I agree with you that um, it's taken a long time, I think, for humanity to step away from the "in order for me to win, you have to lose" kind of mentality. Yeah, and that, that really does. Power, right, Rob, hasn't it? It's been about balance of power. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, an interesting one because one of the things with Open UK is that we are focused geographically, and we're focused on building community and trying to engage people in this geographic space across projects. And I've always wondered how much the breakdown of communities in the UK, because that's where I happen to be living, has focused people on international communities that they engage with as part of open, because it's very much about people all over the world being able to, to work together. And if everybody, anybody else like me who has a life like Matt's also, I think, and Jonathan's and many others uh, where you are engaged with open communities you often find that the community you're part of and the people you're closest to are scattered across the globe mm. something like the pandemic focuses you back Brexit also did it for me focuses you back on the folk around you what advice have you got for us on that Matt? I mean I, I think I, I think that's been one of the things that's been fascinating about what's happened all over the world during this pandemic is that you have started to see um, uh, people starting to look, uh, you know, much closer and self-organise. You know, I mean, they're now our village self-organised, you know, almost every village in, in Britain self-organised to uh, provide services and support to, uh, to their communities. And I do think it's made people, uh, uh, you're absolutely right, it has made people focus much more on on, uh, on their local communities. And I, and I mean, I think for us to, you know, with my slightly more political hat on, for us to survive as a species, that's what we need to do, um, you know, is, is, uh, is get back to understanding that, that that's what makes us different. You know, that's where the power of, uh, of the human species has always been. And we've we've kind of forgotten that I think whether or not this will drive long term change or not who knows, but but I mean you know there's 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 uh, examples of this happening all over the world all the time isn't it of of people spontaneously forming these communities, you know I mean you look at the the uh, the stuff about the um, the K-pop community you know uh, um, disrupting the the uh, Trump rally. You know, I mean, these things are just weird. You know, it's like, and, and they're spontaneous. You know, from all over the world of people just just springing up. And I suppose things like Black Lives Matter are as well. You know, so yeah, yeah, focusing people back locally. Now we've got um, Magda and Gaz. I don't know if either of you want to ask Matt anything. Well, you've got the opportunity in this relatively small group today. Um, <laughs> So I realise you're probably being exposed to a much bigger community on YouTube, but if you've got anything for Matt, feel free to jump in. Uh, yes, do you hear me? I can, yep. Okay. Hi. Perfect. My name is Magda and I have a question. Um, you mentioned those kind of uh, um, sense of accomplishment, etc., but I was wondering for coding community, is there anything particular that you do uh, when it comes to legal compliance, any training or any uh, anything related to um, licenses knowledge? So, yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, it, I would, you know, I would say it depends, right? I mean, um, I, I think uh, most if you're working open source for a company, then um, folks tend to have had some, at least some basic uh, level of understanding about software licenses <coughs> as part of their job. Um, the the governance of a project can also um, have impact on on that. Um, 
you know, we particularly when you get into into working on projects that are looked after by foundations, um, there tends to be pretty clear um, uh, documentation in uh, the contributing guides. Um, that people have to do things like either sign um, contributor license agreements or um, just sign offs in in GitHub so that there is uh, you know signed commits. Um, so there is a kind of, uh, um, I would say, particularly for big pro bigger projects, there is a pretty high awareness of, of uh, intellectual property issues. Um, smaller, smaller projects, I guess, you know, it, 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 it depends. Um, I think most folks who work in open source as, as coders are pretty familiar with at least the the basic licenses that they're likely to come across on a regular basis, you know, Apache, GPL, whatever. Um, you know, Apache is so widespread now. That, you know, I'd say those those more permissive licenses have, have kind of become the the standard for uh, for for most open source development. Um, but yeah, in in bigger projects where there's there's uh, you know commercial things at stake for companies it's it's pretty um it's pretty well understood now the the processes and you know there's this is part of as a as a uh, as a community leader either a technical leader or a community leader um uh creating things like your contributing guide in your repository is a is a fundamental part of uh, creating an open source project and in that contributing guide you would typically have something that says you know uh, everything here is under x license um, and uh, and you know here are the terms under which you need to to contribute either if you need a CLA or if you need a uh, to do sign commits or whatever does that answer your question yes thank you very much Yes. Did you have anything before we, we hand over to Rob? Okay. Um, one other thing that I noticed was you referenced Jono's book and uh, his website and the, the Bacon Method. I guess I was at Canonical before you. I met Jono in 2008 when he was a mere lad building the Ubuntu community. Um, and I'm delighted to say that he's actually going to keynote from California the Open UK Awards on the 24th. For anybody who didn't see, we had 84 nominations for the awards, which I think for our first year is brilliant. And uh, hopefully you'll all get a chance to hear Jono on the 20th of October, no doubt talking a bit about community map. Yeah, I would highly recommend all of all of his stuff. Yeah, like I said, I think he was one of the first people to actually ever do that job. I mean, that's the other important thing to remember around all these things is that like these are new crafts, you know, these these are new practices that, you know, even community management as a as a as a practice has been around for, you know, less than a decade, probably. And and when we look at some of the other roles that exist in in terms of uh, building communities, particularly the developer advocate role, which is a uh, uh, more on the the kind of project promotion and getting people into the top of that uh, that that funnel um, that we looked at earlier you know those roles really have probably only existed for five or six years so a lot of this stuff we're we're only just codifying what these jobs mean you know and and uh, probably prior to to Jono's time um, projects never really had those kind of community managers or uh, or or uh, certainly not developer advocates you know they were much much uh, more Just, led by the technology as we've got you um you know it's a real privilege to have you spend the time with us matt um could you just explain a little bit to people i know that it's not always clear what these developer advocate roles means but, you know what that kind of job actually is to people on the outside yeah so i mean uh, developer advocates can be a variety of things again you know as much as uh, as the community manager role can be it's a it's a role that tends to wear many hats um but, but ultimately developer advocates are about encouraging either user growth or, or developer growth. And they're also about um, uh, connecting the user base into um, you know, the, the developer organization. So 
Uh, sometimes they sit as part of marketing. Um, there's quite a few companies where they sit that role in marketing more. I think that, that more effectively, the, there is another model where they sit in terms of product, which they do in my organization. And uh, developer advocates typically will do things like conference talks, um, blogging, uh, social media. Uh, they're going to be building demos of the product, writing about it, um, and and just um, going out there and speaking with the whatever the base is that you're trying to build, whether that be users or developers, to to encourage people to uh, to to use it. It's actually quite a um, it's quite a uh, it's a difficult job to do and it's a difficult job to hire for um, because you need a lot of contextual knowledge to do it effectively and the more the more you know so if i'm a developer advocate for a particular um you know a programming language i really need to understand the context of why that program language is better than any other program language so that ultimately means i end up not having to know all the things about program languages and you know the more complex the the software uh, the more complex that becomes in terms of what the skills are that are required from developer advocates but ultimately they're highly technical people who are also are very good at explaining um you know translating uh, ideas and translating technical information um so some of them have come from being developers uh, some of them have come from backgrounds like mine where i've been a systems architect and and built companies and built products um but it, yeah it's a, and it's a that community worldwide has grown gigantically over the last uh, three or four years you know there's there's probably you know a few thousand people now with that job title uh, globally uh, i think when i even when i started in that kind of uh, space um there was a few hundred so it's it's become and, and again it's you know a lot of this comes down to uh, that explosion in open source software you know it's uh you know how do you best market um market your project market your product to technical folks you know i mean there was a time a decade ago where you know uh, software was really sold to um you know cios in suits who'd never actually used it and had no understanding of technology and that whole model now has turned on its head where most inside most companies technology uh technology decisions are being driven by engineers and so you know, when we want to grow um, to grow uh, communities around around software, those are the people who we need to be speaking to. Does that make sense, Amanda? It's absolutely perfect, Matt. I'm going to hand over to Rob, but thank you. Thank you. I uh, just want to say thank you for everyone for joining today. Um, Next week, Amanda, who remind who we have next week? Sorry, uh, we've lost Chris, who was going to wrap up for us today. Matt, we're normally a little bit more organised. It's uh, my bad. Next week, we have Don Foster, also picking up in community, but talking about being good corporate citizens and contributing to communities and projects. Fantastic. Thank you, everyone. Cheers. Take care. Matt, thanks so much. Speak to you soon. Bye bye. Bye. Bye.